Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Tidd, since we've been talking here this morning, four people in this country have died of overdoses just in the last hour. As many people have died in the last month as were killed on September 11th, including one a day in my state of Maine. I can't believe we're having the same conversation today that I remember having with General Kelly two or three years ago and getting this figure of 8% of ISR resources and 25% of known drug shipments interdicted, 75% get through. I think you've admitted, identified the problem. If we give you a mission, you will deal with it. The problem is nobody has this mission. And I hope you will go back and talk to this interagency group and talk to the White House. It is inexcusable to be sitting here three or four years later and still only being able to interdict 25% of the drug shipments that we know about. And we would know about more if we had adequate ISR. This is simply a question of allocation of resources. And this is the most serious public health problem this country faces. Four people have died in the last hour. And we're still talking about, and you're giving me the same figures that, Admiral, that General Kelly gave three or four years ago. Can you commit to me that you will move this to the highest level of priority and uh, kick some behinds and take some names in this, uh, in this interagency cooperation? Please don't come back here again next year with the same testimony. Senator, I can commit to you that not only will I, but I have continued to communicate the challenge that we face. I, I will observe the services, the biggest challenge they have to be able to provide additional resources, which they recognize very clearly are required, uh, are challenged by the inability to have budget predictability to be able to produce more forces to make them available. It's, this is a team sport. This is a team effort. We have to work together as, uh, as, as constructively and collaboratively as possible. Well, my commitment to you is that I will do everything within my power to do my part. Hopefully, we've just passed a two-year budget authorization. We will Hopefully, again, we'll have the, the final numbers within the next two or three weeks, and then we will be able to move forward. But please make this the highest priority. And I'm not, I'm not uh, attacking you. I'm attacking the failure of our structure to, to adequately get at a problem when we have it right in front of us. It would be one thing if we didn't know, but when we have it right in front of us. I'll stop that there. That is an excerpt from NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM commanders testifying at a Senate budget request hearing. Now this is a very long video, but there is an incredible amount of great information in it. Um, down in the description, I'm going to go ahead and put some uh, different timestamps throughout this to illustrate the story that I have been trying to get out to the American public. I don't have a huge platform, but if I can continue to talk about this, I will. I will ring this bell about the issue going on in the Fourth Fleet in the Caribbean Sea, Southcom. Now, this guy, Kurt Tidd, has been talking about this for a long time. October 30, 2015, he took command. This is USNI News, and these are just the things they've covered. March 10, 2016, the head of Southern Command told the Senate Armed Service Committee, does not have the ships or aircraft to fully carry out the interdiction mission to stop the flow of drugs. April 10, 2017, Russia, China, Iran, increasing interest in Central and South America. August 30, 2017, knowing that he didn't have enough money to stop them, they tried to take money and interrupt the networks. And he goes, he goes on and on. October 19, 2017, trying to engage allies. February 16, 2018, and that was what we were talking about. Doesn't have the money, but what do we see in May? Apparently there's money for other things that I, I, I don't even get this. This, it just goes more to this dystopian, make-believe world that is going on in Washington. On one hand, they say, oh, Russia's no big deal, Russia's a Christian country, Russia's really our friend, we don't need to worry about them, but then they do this. We should stop talking about Russia, but then they do this. And this isn't the media, CNN didn't order the Navy to reestablish U.S. Second Fleet. In one of those articles that I just showed you, 
this is the admiral speaking, not me, not some liberal, some crazy person. We need to work on the root cause, the demand for narcotics in the United States, and to commit a years-long effort to improve living conditions throughout Central America, Gortney said. Wait a minute. Really? This is a United States Navy admiral who has been doing this for a long time. He told the panel that border security with Mexico was not nearly as effective as we would like it to be. A wall will not solve the problem. Okay, this is Admiral Kurt Tidd. And in that testimony before the Senate committee, there's a spot in there, and I will label it in the description, where he actually reaffirms this, where he says that the vast majority of illegal drugs or whatever people that come through our southern land border, come through legal border crossings, smuggled through, that would be there even after a wall. So this is the issue. This is the big problem. And there's chart after chart after chart that shows this. One second. Let me get the right one up here. There you go. This is how it works. This is where the big problem is. Colombia. We have sent them billions and billions and billions in aid. And it has got nothing but worse and worse and worse. Over the last 50 years. This is talks about marijuana here. The red is this something called hashish. We don't really have a huge problem with that here but opioids are part of this these are where the networks are through the Caribbean Sea through the Gulf of Mexico now I brought this up to show you this and this would absolutely make most people scratch their heads and wonder what world we're living in see this was prior to the US deciding to destroy the Venezuelan economy they weren't complaining about Venezuela when Venezuela was providing health care and housing and education for 13 million plus people, 5 million of which actually left Colombia because of the war down there between U.S.-backed right-wing paramilitaries and left-wing paramilitaries trying to save their sovereignty. See, you would think this would be the other way around now. And they're talking about now, Colombia's talking about shutting its borders after years and years and years of Colombians fleeing the violence created by this. And I've shown you this before. I mean, I have a very, very smart audience. I have a very, very intelligent audience. I want you to think about what would happen if the government decided to subsidize one state in the United States and attack the other one that was right next to each other. Let's just think of, um, let's think of, two, let's say Nebraska and Iowa. I'm just picking two out of a hat here. If they decided, okay, people of Nebraska, we're going to send you 80 times the amount of money than we send the people of Iowa, and we're going to sanction the people of Iowa, and we're going to um, take everything that goes wrong in Iowa, and we're going to make it a federal case, and we're just going to kind of explain away and just kind of ignore the issues that go on in Nebraska. What do you think eventually would happen to the state of Iowa versus the state of Nebraska? And it's the exact same issue down here. If you look at the amount of money given to Colombia, look at every other country down there. The number one and number two suppliers of cocaine, narcotics, and illegal drugs to this hemisphere account for $400 million a year. Including Mexico, the rest of them all combined don't come to that number. And this is something I know a lot of people who watch my videos aren't going to like to see. What this says. I mean, look at where it was at one time. And look at what was going on prior to the last year or so. The money was going away down there. But now the FARC is rearming. And 
things are getting ready to light up down there in a way that you've not seen before. And the issue goes back quite a ways. It really does. And this giant exodus that I spoke of yesterday in Venezuela, and you can look this up for yourself. This is the population of Venezuela going back to 2008. Some people come and make comments, oh, socialism has been destroying Venezuela for years down there. Really? In 1960, Venezuela had a population of 7.6 million people. <clears throat> By 2008, 45 years later, it had quadrupled, and now it's quintupled. So I don't know what more than you can take from this. I mean, from 2016 to 2017, which should have been the throes of this crisis, their population actually went up during this giant exodus. Almost a million more people from 2014 to 2017. And this is trading economics. This is just, just fact. And I brought up this article, I've talked about it before, about the issue with drinking water. And they say something in here that actually will give you an indication of what things used to be like down there. Let's see if I can find it real quick. In the 1950s and 60s, huge infrastructure projects to create dams and aqueducts largely solved the access problem of water. A lot of water, just not a lot of water where the people live. Consistent and widespread investment were made through the 1970s and early 80s. In 1989, as part of an effort to fix contamination, Venezuela even proposed splitting the water treatment utility into 10 privatized entities. That didn't happen. The Caldera administration in the 1990s poured major investment into Hydroven. For much of this time, if not all of this time, Venezuela was known as one of the world's most electrically advanced nations. At one point, it had more citizens with electric access than Spain or Portugal. One of its main industries was aluminum, accounted for 10% of global production. So tell me again about this uh, issue with uh, it being not diverse enough in its exports or its economic model which demands enormous amounts of electrical usage independability on top of that gasoline was free and in this time and we showed this yesterday there wasn't a whole bunch of constitutional uh, republic capitalists running the country you go back that far and they were all Socialists, leftists, democratic types. And they were an incredibly wealthy, incredibly successful nation. The problem, the problem is this. The U.S. financing the war right next door. Over and over and over again. This was the issue Venezuela had to deal with. This war, quote-unquote, war on drugs. That was really just a U.S. client state down there supplying drugs to certain people, but not others, and criminalizing some and not others. And now the big problem, of course, the giant problem in the, in the area is this little tiny Venezuela, $4.3 million a year, probably the smallest number down here, let's see, well, Uruguay's got half a million, Argentina half a million. Argentina doesn't need our money. Buenos Aires used to be one of the wealthiest, highest GDPs in the entire world. Ecuador, 0.8 million. But the two big ones, Colombia and Peru, strangely enough, is where the most violence is. See the pattern? The Admiral, the Admiral of Southcom knows what's going on. And if you listen to this, the frustration that's going on with this issue, and now we're going to stand up a fleet. We have all this money, and apparently we're just not taking the problem seriously. I don't even know what more to say, but pray for the people in Panama and pray for the people in Costa Rica. Because those are the two last real strongholds of peaceful U.S. settlement down there.
and I'm sure that's going to be going away pretty quick. So like, share, subscribe.